Painting human skin is hard. For most of us, when we look in the mirror each day, we see a human. Many of us may even have friends or family who are human. The point is, painting human skin is the most intimidating because we're so familiar with it. If we lived in a world where everyone was made of living metal or living plastic, we would see those textures as the hardest thing to paint as well. In cartooning, this principle is sometimes referred to as the uncanny valley. It's the reason why Garfield is the peak of masculinity and Tom Hanks is, uh, well. It's also the reason why painting skin on orcs, trolls, or squigs doesn't have that same intimidation factor as painting humans. The closer something looks to ourselves, the more unsettling it can look if we get it wrong. Welcome back to Journey to Indomitus. Today, we're gonna try and paint some skin. Well, sometimes on this channel, I present myself as an expert or teacher sort of character. Today, we're not doing that. Today I'm going to be honest, I don't have a lot of experience painting human skin. The most human flesh I've painted in the past few years is a face, maybe a bare arm or two. I generally avoid realistic skin tones when I can because it's hard. And that's not a good thing. In painting, as well as in life in general, I try to pay attention to those things that seem scary or difficult to me because those are probably the things I need to be working on. So using that as our compass, I'm really glad that we're making a video on painting skin today. This week, I've been trying to finish up all the Sisters of Battle, and several of them have areas with a lot of human flesh. I kind of left these for last, I think subconsciously, because I was intimidated by them. So I think they'll be perfect for today's demonstration purposes. First things first, everyone gets a matte black prime. I'm using an airbrush here because it's easy, but you know the drill, any sort of spray or brush on primer will do fine. In fact, for everything going forward, if you don't have an airbrush, feel free to just use a large dry brush to do the next few steps. Once our prime is done, we're gonna give every model a Zenithal highlight to start off with. This makes everything a little bit easier than just starting from a black base coat. But today, instead of just a normal Zenithal highlight with a gray and white spray, we're gonna give these models a blood Zenithal highlight. So that's a red mid-tone and then a final white spray instead of the usual gray and then white spray. My reasoning for this, blood is red and skin is translucent. So at any point that we can, we wanna add red tones to the shadows of these figures to show that blood underneath the skin. With the Arcoflagellants, we're gonna do something similar, but I figured because they are no longer really living, it might be interesting to use a mid-tone of purple instead of red. For the poor man <laughs> strapped to the Penitent Engine, I went ahead and painted the Penitent Engine in the same colors as the rest of my Sisters of Battle. If you want to see how I did that, I have a whole video on painting Sisters of Battle armor, and I'm just using the same steps here for the Penitent Engine. And then once that's done, we're going to give the flesh parts of that model a quick spray from above using the same white ink we used for the rest of the figures. With our Zenith all complete, it's time to go to bed and let that white ink set overnight, because it tends to flake off easily if you don't give it enough time to dry. In the morning, I wrote some of this script that I'm reading right now, <laughs> and then got back to painting. To save time, we're gonna load up our wet palette with as many of the common skin tone colors that I can think of. Anything I can imagine I think I might need for this project is going onto the palette up front to allow for maximum creativity and to save time later. Before we start, I'm gonna give each paint a drop of glaze medium to increase the drying time, flow, and transparency, and then mix each of them together with a drop of water. Because we're gonna be doing a lot of experimenting today, I wanted to thin down each of these paints as much as possible to give us as many options as possible. As usual, if you don't have a wet palette, you can use a regular palette, and if you don't have a glaze medium, you can thin with water. I'm gonna be using all the generic names for the paints in this video, but there'll be a full list down in the description if you want the specific paints that I used. To get started, I'm just applying a base skin tone to all the living figures, leaving the Arcoflagellants for later. I have about four different base skin tones on my palette, and I'm just carefully glazing them onto each of the figures, making sure to use thin coats to let the undershading show through. Once I'm satisfied with that, I'm going to use a dark red glaze to add some natural shadows to each of the figures. 
Applying this color to the undersides and crevices of the figures gives them this little bit of life and a more natural skin tone to sort of reflect the blood underneath the skin. Once again, skin is translucent, and we want to see some of that redness no matter what the skin tone. At this point, we're purposefully taking these shadows a little bit too far, and then we're going to tone them back a little bit later. Once that's done, we're going to do the same thing with our highlights, using a combination of different lighter tones like pale sand or pale blue to add extreme highlights to all of the figures. I'm experimenting here with different highlight colors. Pale sand is a much warmer color and pale blue is sort of a cooler color. So on different figures, I'm experimenting with different colored highlights to give a more warm highlight or cool highlight effect and seeing how it affects the figure. Once we're satisfied with our extreme highlights, we can glaze on some of our base skin tone to bring all of our highlights and shadows back into a more reasonable range. And this is the basic principle I ended up using for all of our flesh tones here. Add some extreme highlights or shadows, and then when they go too far, we just bring them back to our normal range by using transparent glazes of the initial skin tone. We can do this as many times as we like until it looks good. I find that by doing this, it adds some depth to our skin tones, as well as showing a number of different colors beneath the top layer of skin, just like in real life. In some cases, we may also want to glaze on a little bit of a lighter skin tone as an additional highlight or to add some variety. By experimenting, you can stumble on all kinds of color combinations that work well together. And if you make a mistake, because we're working with really thin glazes, it's easy to remove or paint over anything that just isn't working. If you're not sure where the highlights and shadows should fall on a figure, try looking at reference photos of real people, or even at pictures of how the studio or other painters have painted these specific figures. Another quick tip that I found helpful was if you ever get stuck and your skin is not looking quite right, you can try adding a selective wash of Reichland Flesh Shade. This is a magic wash that will make anything look like a naturalistic skin tone. I probably used a little bit of Reichland at some point on every one of these figures. For the Arco Flagellants, I ended up using the same techniques, but allowed myself to go a little bit more extreme with the colors that I used. Pale blue base tones, purple and green shadow washes, and more extreme highlights. Nothing was off the table when I was painting these figures. It was fun to paint these because they're so strange looking that basically any combination of colors can make sense for them. As always, the key to painting anything that we find intimidating is just being brave enough to try new things, take risks, and see what works. In the end, I realized that painting natural human skin tones is no different than painting squigs. I basically just used the same techniques here that I used in my original video on glazing squigs from last year. Once all of the skin tones were complete on all of our figures, I painted the clothing and accessories with the same basic colors and techniques that I used for the main units of the Sisters of Battle army that I've been building. I'm not going to go through that in detail here because this is a skin tutorial, but if you want to see the colors I used for my army and some of the techniques that I applied, you can always go and check out the initial Sisters of Battle painting tutorial that I posted a couple weeks ago. In the end, painting skin was was not as terrifying as I thought it would be. In fact, it was maybe the most fun I had on any of these Sisters of Battle units so far. If you have any more questions or specific details about how I painted these, the paint list is down in the description. And for anything else, feel free to leave a question down in the comments and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Although this video took a little bit longer to make than usual, I really enjoyed making it. I'm sure you noticed the editing style is a little bit different, and that's because I was inspired by a few of my favorite YouTube channels, including Miscast and 52 Miniatures, to film a more casual tutorial with a lot more personal anecdotes and fun and interesting B-roll to keep the video from getting too boring. If you haven't seen either of these channels, I encourage you to check out both of them. Links in the description and maybe on the screen right now. I, I don't... I don't know, I haven't edited this part yet. As always, I want to extend a huge thank you to all of my patrons for supporting me on here. I wouldn't be able to make these videos without you. If you'd like to see your name up here or get access to bonus content, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Dana Howell. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks for sharing this amazing year with me. I will see you in 2021.